Thank you very much, uh, Professor Carrillo. And as we sit down and ponder some of, the, um, some of the things that would have come forth in the presentation of the report, we are extremely pleased to have to deliver our keynote address this morning, Ms. Vashti Maraj, Head Director of Legal Services from the Ministry of Science and Technology. And uh, she would be representing, or she is representing today, uh, the Minister, Senator, the Honorable Dr. Rupert Griffith. So we would uh, please ask Ms. Maraj to come forward and deliver our keynote address. Let's give her, let's give her a hand. Hello, good morning. What a very dynamic and innovative presentation. I'm quite inspired by the words of Professor Carrillo. The only way to go from here is up. Good morning, Mrs. Ingrid Siratan, Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Science and Technology and other members of the Ministry's Executive Management Team. Directors of the IGOV TT Board, Mr. Salvon Ramroop, Deputy Chief Executive Officer of IGOV TT and the sponsor of this national launch of the 2014 edition of the World Economic Forum Global Information and Technology Report. Professor Miguel Carrillo, Executive Director and Professor of Strategy of the Arthur Lukjak Graduate School of Business. Mr. Balraj Kisto, Faculty Head of the Arthur Lukjak Graduate School of Business. ICT sector stakeholders, the business and financial community, special invited guests. Ladies and gentlemen, a pleasant good morning to you all. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for all for attending this important presentation. Kindly accept the sincere apologies of the Minister of Science and Technology, Dr. The Honorable Rupert Griffith. Unfortunately, he could not be here with us this morning due to another national priority engagement. I must thank the World Economic Forum for producing this enlightening report, and I especially want to thank the Arthur Lukjak Graduate School of Business for, for facilitating the launch of the 2014 Global Information and Technology Results. This study will certainly assist us in gauging our national e-readiness by providing critical data and benchmarks that can guide our national strategic planning and marketing strategy for information and communications technology within Trinidad and Tobago and also serve as a critical indicator for the areas of greater focus and development as we forge ahead with the development of a dynamic, knowledge-based society driven by the innovative use of ICT. The fact that so many of us are here today speaks an interesting understanding and appreciation of the importance of ICTs to the economy of Trinidad and Tobago. In fact, ICT is now positioned as an essential element in the infrastructure underpinning diversification efforts and the structural competitiveness of our economy. In recognition of the importance of ICT as a critical driver for sustainable economic growth and development, the government has identified ICT in its policy framework for sustainable development as one of the seven interconnected pillars, wherein pillar five, Creating a more diversified, knowledge-intensive economy serves as a core pillar and as a significant catalyst towards building innovative capacity and improving economic competitiveness. Further to this, in the government's medium-term policy framework 2014, ICT has been identified as an essential cornerstone in the government's thrust to development of an innovation-driven economy. In this context, the government plays a dual role. On the one hand, it must leverage ICT in pursuit of its development objectives. ICT for development, ICT 4D. On the other hand, it must also seek to foster industrial development through the establishment of a productive business ecosystem which leverages technology to improve competitiveness at the level of the firm and internationally. In this regard, the successful pursuit of the aforementioned initiatives will contribute to Trinidad and Tobago's ranking in key international indices, such as the one we're here to discuss this morning. 
To this end, the Ministry of Science and Technology has forged ahead with its overriding mandates in coordinating and fostering the development of two key areas that are critical to national growth and development, science and technology and innovation, one of which was highlighted as a key driver, as well as its corollary, information and communications technology. In this realm, the Ministry of Science and Technology has spearheaded the National ICT Plan, labeled Smart CT. A Trinidad and Tobago that will be people-centered, knowledge-based nation driven by the innovative use of ICT to enhance social, economic, and cultural development. Smart TT has as a driving force the social and economic transformation of the society by focusing on the following five thematic areas. Innovation and human capital development, access and digital inclusion, e-business and ICT sector development, infrastructure development, as well as e-government. The Ministry of Science and Technology has therefore sought to actively proceed with the execution of Smart TT, while ensuring its cross-cutting harmonization with previous and ongoing ICT initiatives within Trinidad. On a macroeconomic level, therefore, a multi-stakeholder public and private sector approach has been undertaken. Taking into consideration the government's recognition of the importance of ICT in economic development and in driving all competitiveness, we have finalized the second iteration of the national ICT strategy. Several projects and programs which have been initiated, which are fundamentally linked to the key indicators for development, as highlighted before and competitiveness on a global scale. This would be discussed in great depth during the panel discussion that will soon follow. Within the political and regulatory milieu, the government is poignantly aware of the importance of the development of a comprehensive and robust e-legislative framework that can be trusted by citizens, institutions, and businesses. It, was, it is with this in mind that the ministry is taking the requisite proactive steps to ensure that the following key pieces of legislation are advanced. Amendment to the Telecommunications Act, full proclamation of both the electronic transactions as well as the Data Protection Act, the cybercrime and cybersecurity agency bills which are currently before Parliament, Electronic Transfer Funds Crime Amendment Act. I am pleased to advise that one of the critical facets of the recently passed finance bill is that the necessary amendments were made to the Exchequer and Audit Act, as well as the Electronic Transactions Act, in order to allow for the electronic transfer of money by or to a department of government that would empower the government to collect revenue and make payments electronically. This is certainly a milestone in the ease of doing business with government agencies in Trinidad and Tobago in the area of development of infrastructure and digital content. The National ICT Plan includes within the ambit the deployment of a national broadband plant. And to this end, the government of Trinidad and Tobago is engaging the expert advisory services of the World Bank Group in the execution of the national broadband strategy, leading to the implementation of several key broadband infrastructure, as well as demand side initiatives which will not only lead to the increased broadband geographical coverage and penetration, but also the development of a converged ICT legislative framework and a new international subsea cable system and landing station for Trinidad and Tobago. To date, I am pleased to advise that we are at the verge of establishing our national internet exchange point for Trinidad and Tobago and have initiated a competitive authorization process for the provision of a public domestic mobile telecommunications network and public telecommunication <coughs> services by a potential third mobile operator, thus leading to the further liberalization of the telecommunication sector. On the developmental plane, the National ICT Plan contains several programs that are aimed at in the increased usage and uptake of ICT by citizens, businesses, and government. This is naturally built upon the development of a solid and reliable national ICT infrastructure in which great credence is placed on iGovTT, 
which plays a critical role in the execution and administration of the government's enterprise-wide ICT strategies and programs. In this regard, the government has significantly invested in the development and ongoing deployment of several enterprise-wide ICT projects with the aim of creating a shared common ICT architecture for use by all government agencies and also increase the availability and efficiency of e-government services. As a government, we are poignantly aware of the need to bridge the gap in the digital divide between those who not only lack access to the internet, but also access to ICT. In this regard, the Ministry of Science and Technology has successfully launched the START project, which aims to establish a user-friendly, technology-enabled environment accommodating underserved communities by the introduction, by the introduction sorry, of community-based access centers. This project will allow community members quick access to information, training, and e-government services in the underserved and least developed areas of Trinidad and Tobago, as well as among traditionally underserved groups, such as the physically challenged, the elderly, and at-risk youth. Today, community access centers have been opened in Pinal and Kumano, with the imminent opening of an access center at Guayaguayari. It is our intention to introduce 44 community access centers by the end of 2016. The Ministry takes its responsibility as a champion and vanguard of ICT and continues its campaign of sensitization and promotion of its use through seminars such as ICT for Women and Girls and the upcoming ICT for Seniors Seminar in Trinidad and Tobago in order to bring home to the various groups of society the daily impact and utility which technology can impart on our lives. Ladies and gentlemen, the importance of ICT lies not only in the technology itself, but in its ability to shape economic, social, and political structures. ICTs present a myriad of opportunities to connect, to educate, and to empower. Let me state this clearly. The Ministry of Science and Technology has a clear focus and a clear sense of where it is going and how it wants to get there. We are indeed committed to the development of a vibrant and dynamic digital society. Once again, let me appreciate my appreciation for the Arthur Lookjack Graduate School of Business and in turn, the World Economic Forum for presenting the findings of the Global Information and Technology Report to us today. I welcome this study and its findings and policy recommendations fortified with this knowledge. I firmly believe that we'll be better able to meet the challenges ahead. And yes, there's no better way to go than up. On this note, I thank you all, and may God bless you. Once again, let's thank Ms. Maraj for delivering our, the keynote address. Okay. All right. During the course of the morning, we've heard about a number of, of different things. Um, Ms. Maraj herself referred to the fact that we have to develop a productive business ecosystem in order to leverage the potential of ICTs in our economy. We have to be able to harness the opportunities that ICTs represent for the uh, building of a sustainable development capacity into the future. And one of or the Arthur Lockjack Graduate School of Business has positioned itself or is about to position itself within the need to develop those things that Ms. Miraj mentioned um, with the introduction of our Masters of Information Systems and Technology Management that's due to start in September 2014. Um, while Professor Carrillo was going through his presentation, I also, with the, uh, the report, I also noted the fact that the rankings in terms of business innovation, while they may have been somewhat controversial 
in the context of the audience, but the um, the the rankings in terms of of uh, what's it? business usage, um, we definitely need to improve those. And it is that kind of thing we, we seek to produce. We seek to produce graduates who have both the technical expertise married with the strong management capacity to truly harness and, and, and to be able to develop our ICT potential within our economy. And uh, so that's in that context of we'll be introducing this, this program in September 2014. Some of the courses um, will be, we have core courses looking at uh, enterprise systems and business intelligence business system integration and technology adoption. Of course, we'll be also looking at um, e-commerce, um, information technology governance, right? We have a, a number of things in this uh, program, okay? Um, in addition to which, we will be looking to develop graduates who are able to take on uh, future challenges, right? One of the things that we note is that when you're talking about ICTs in particular, although it is also applicable generally to the global context, when you're talking about ICTs in particular, you're talking about a very rapid process of development and change. And it is in this context that we also need to be able to develop graduates who can handle not only harnessing the potential of these ICTs now, but who are able to go on to further specialization, to do research, who are able to continue to acquire skills related to ICTs as the demand increases and changes into the future. So I'll have Professor Carrillo come and, and tell us a bit more. Six, 60 seconds, you know, and excuse us, but if you're not part of, a, uh, of the solution, you're part of the problem, right? <clears throat> a typical question that, you know, it's always asked at the level of business and academia is, why are we so behind in terms of our capacity for innovation. You see that we don't have access to technology. You see that we really don't know how to innovate. But really and truly, innovation works whenever you have a base of consumers that demand innovation. Okay? And to be quite honest, we are not really that demanding in terms of uh, innovativeness in our uh, products or services offering. We are quite a standard, uh, one. And two, although there is a certain level of technology adoption in businesses and consumers, certainly our degree or level of sophistication of uh, technology utilization is quite basic still. So one of the reasons behind this program is to increase the level of sophistication and be able to create a pool of professional that will be able to pull the demand for, um, <clears throat> for technology and, and uh, information technology, especially champion that the utilization of technology in general, and in particular information technology, in companies and, uh, and organizations. So if you take a look at the program, uh, it's quite different. It's not a typical uh, program uh, of, uh, related to information technology. But there are a couple of things that's interesting. About one third of the core courses will be actually taught not by a person, but by companies. We're actually hiring companies to teach a course, not only faculty. And one of the reasons is because there might not be a single a single individual who has all the resources and all the knowledge on a particular field, you know, um, companies like, uh, like uh, Lorcan's, for instance, or Microsoft. You know, we are actually hiring companies to teach, which I think uh, it's quite innovative. I'm pretty sure that you haven't heard this before. Uh, but it's fundamental because they are, gonna, they are in charge of applying this, you know, they could give you the actual real life application. And on top of that, you have three specializations, right? Um, the e-business specialization, 
the information systems audit and control, and um, information security management. So um, September 2014, the next frontier of technology here at the Logjack. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Carrillo. All right, we'll move on now to our panel session with question and answer. And uh, as I invite the distinguished panelists to come forward to the, to, the, uh, to the stage, at which point I will introduce them, I am asked, we are asking members of our audience, ladies and gentlemen, that you please write down the questions as we will be, able to, as we will be taking questions during the course of um, the panel discussion. So please write down your questions and I, people will be coming to take them and uh, give them to the panelists. All right, uh, thank you. Um, the moderator for our panel discussion this morning is Dr. Ronald, Ronald sorry, Ramkisun, economist. And we also have panelists, Ms. Lisa Agard, legal consultant in the Ministry of Science and Technology. We have Dr. Mauricia Alana Kim Ortega, who is a consultant in the Ministry of Science and Technology. Mr. Selvan Ramroop, who came up before, um, the Deputy Chief Executive Officer of iGovTT. And we have uh, Mr. Lorcan Camps, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Infotech Caribbean Limited. Mr. Dr. Ramkisun. A pleasant good morning to everyone. Um, it is indeed a pleasure to be asked by uh, the Arthur Lockjack Graduate School to moderate this panel, whose members have been introduced by Ms. Headley. We are here this morning to discuss the report, uh, the Global uh, Information Technology Report, in particular, the Network Readiness Index 2014. We had the presentation by Professor Carrillo, and I'm sure that there are questions, um, aspects, uh, comments, and what we are going to do in this panel is to attempt to, to discuss uh, different aspects of this report, but in the context of what is happening in Trinidad and Tobago. We had the presentation on behalf of the minister by Ms. Maraj, which gave us a broader dimension of that network readiness index. And quite useful in terms of the, the broad perspectives, uh, the, the, the broad direction in which the ministry is, is heading. We will also have our panelists talk about the various uh, dimensions of that go into some greater details as to what is happening. Uh, remembering that the, the Network Readiness Index and what it seeks to measure, the the state of, status of the ICT industry, if you like, the status of business in the context of the overall Trinidad and Tobago economy. Sometimes I find that we either talk about the economy by itself, about growth in GDP, the unemployment rate, interest rates, etc without, and we also talk about ICT and what ICT is doing in a vacuum. 
So we discuss the network readiness index sometimes, or see it as students, or as business people, or, or whomsoever, as something separate and apart. And I think that we need to have a conversation which is far more dynamic in linking ICT to national socioeconomic development. Because at the end of the day, what happens in this neck of the woods, if you like, impacts directly and indirectly on the rate of economic growth in Trinidad and Tobago. And for those of you present, I think you will be far richer when you walk out this room as a result of the discussion by the panelists, which we will try as, and I ask them as much as possible, to keep simple so that we understand what is happening and we can go out there and we can enroll for courses and we can discuss that ICT is really a critical component, critical dimension of national economic growth in Trinidad and Tobago, as indeed the rest of the world. And if for some reason one of you does not believe me, um, you would note there is a very high correlation if you compare the competitiveness index of the World Economic Forum, the performance of countries, the human development index of the United Nations with the performance of ICT and of that sector. So the countries that are doing very well, that are growing steadily, strong, notwithstanding challenges, you find them rank very high in respect of the readiness index. Singapore, you pick anyone. Not that they don't have challenges, but if you take the long view, you see that, and therefore, the conclusion must be, we have to have a conversation which links uh, better ICT and, uh, and economic growth. So, what are some of the highlights, just to, to remind us all, uh, of what transpired, we, there's a marginal improvement in the overall network readiness index. Uh, uh, but just before I share with you, um, as I, I was mentioning, the global competitiveness index. And in looking at that index, we find, again, in a sense, to support the link between the ICT sector and, and the performance of the economy and competitiveness. When you look at the GCI, the Global Competitive Index, you find our rankings for the last six years have been in the 80s, 90s. The last was 2014, 92. I think it was in terms of the Global Competitiveness Index. And in 2009, yep. it was also 92. Um, not much change, really, in that index. And when you look at the Network Readiness Index, uh, you find that it has been in the, I would say, if the GCI has been in the 80s, 90s, the our Trinidad and Tobago's Network Readiness Index, 60s, 70s. Now, slightly better, but I will not make too much of the figures, but we're talking about 70, 80, 90, which is where we, where, where we are, uh, if you look at the index, uh, the two indices. And similarly, you would find a high correlation between the indices of the developed countries and the developing. So, 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 much, so much for that. So several points were raised by, by Professor Carillo uh, in terms of the areas which we did a bit okay in and or some of our positives 
if you like. And uh, he mentioned uh, uh, several, several areas. In terms of the index itself, we did, we did well in terms of uh, usage or showed, let me say, improvement in terms of usage and then in terms of impact. Uh, but we, we fell a bit in terms of the environment and in terms of the readiness sub-index. And he went through some of those. Some of those. Um, a good place to start is to ask, how do we feel about the results? Um, are they reasonable? And I will first ask maybe someone from the private sector. Uh, as you would know, um, we have uh, three persons from the public sector, uh, and we have Lokan from the private sector. So I first want to ask Lokan, taking a private sector view, how, how do you feel about the results? I think it's pretty average, really. I think we can do a lot better. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's not very exciting. I think there's a lot more than we can do. OK. Uh, so not bad, but much more that we can do. And I want to say this morning yeah. is, in fact, my intention is that we focus on what are these things that we are doing that is likely to lift us to be in the first 10, which should be our goal. Yes. Uh, what are the things that we are doing at present? Are we doing the right things? Are we focusing on the right uh, aspects? Uh, so I think that would be a good question as the first question for me to pose to, to Kim. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Rampisun. I will say, um, from my perspective, the results, is a, they provide a call to action. And from a business perspective, we know sometimes crisis or you know, underperformance is the motivator to do more. So from that perspective, I think we are poised to act, poised to do. And we have started, like Ms. Maraj pointed out, in terms of the accomplishments of the ministry. There is the START project, which is trying to bridge the digital divide. We are acting on the part of government. Um, they have removed taxes on a lot of devices. So you will see on the indicator availability of latest technologies. We are improving there. Why? Because now you can import your devices and not pay taxes on those um, electronics, for example. So we are doing things to create the shift, to create the improvements that we need. Um, early on, for example, there was liberalization of the telecom sector, and we have seen how that has impacted our rankings. Unfortunately, sometimes change takes time. The actions we do today do not necessarily pay off tomorrow, but we have to act now so that we can reap those results. So I see the results as an opportunity to rally the forces and to do actions now that will pay out in the short, medium, and long term. Thanks, Kim. Uh, I now turn to Selvan uh, and ask, if you had to select the area that we are weakest in, Salvon, what would that be? You know, I think Dr. Carillo pointed out quite nicely. Uh, we are ready, but we're not using it. And, and the point is resounding because um, we, Kim pointed out quite nicely, you know, we have done a lot of things, we're putting a lot of things in place. Um, but the usage, we are not using it. We are putting things out there. So it makes a beeline right back to innovation. And what really are we doing from an ICT perspective and from a country perspective to encourage innovation? I know the uh, um, 
Ministry of Planning and Development have focused on various aspects of innovation. But what are we in the ICT sector doing from an innovation standpoint? We are ready. There's no doubt about it in our mind. We are ready. We have infrastructure in place. We, have, um, we are putting the various acts in place, legislation and policies. A lot to be done. A lot has been done. How do we take what we have and put it out there? How do we take what we have and make it um, available and, and get the consumers out there of taking what we've already put out. So as, again, we go back to Ms. Vashti's speech and we spoke about the community access centers. We spoke about TT Connect. We spoke of the various things that infrastructure-wise are in place. We now have to go to the next step. We now have to encourage usage by first of all reaching out to the consumers out there Enabling our services, for example, TT Connect, one argues that all you can do is download forms. That may be so. But remember, you have to put the infrastructure in place before you can engage. So now that we've set the infrastructure in place, now that we have gotten people that are accustomed to getting onto TT Connect for what they need, we will now integrate with the back end, put systems in place in the middle to facilitate integration with back end and front end so that when we, when we go out to the community access centers, when we get the, the elderly in the rural districts going to them instead of traveling to Port of Spain, it will find, you will find, therefore, that the usage and accessibility to government services become greater. So in effect, we're talking about uptake. As I have not spoken on innovation as yet, we are engaged in some activities that will encourage innovation. But I think innovation, and Dr. Carillo pointed out quite nicely in those questions at the end. We are, this is our greatest area, the weakest area in society today, in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, and it's a very key point and targeted at the CEOs. Good. How well do you utilize, and Lorcan will know from a private sector, I, am, I spent a few years in the private sector too as well, how well do CEOs actually utilize current technologies such as CRM and ERP to improve their businesses? Good. We spoke of big data, a new trend, a, a new direction. Uh, but big, big data is another stage of data warehousing and business intelligence. The new course pointed out by, um, by Dr. Carillo speaks to business intelligence too as well. Business intelligence is key for economic growth and development and for, 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 to, to survive and enhance your business, enhance your revenues in today's, day, in, in today's world. So these are areas that require focus. And we, as government in the public sector, have got to put measures in place and do things that take us in that direction. Okay. Uh, I, would, I would have asked Salvon, which perhaps was the area that is in need of improvement, or the main area, and of course he has mentioned several areas, and I think that speaks for itself. I want to ask Lisa to talk to us a little bit about consumer demand. What, what more do consumers want? If consumer demand is to drive what is supplied, and if we argue, and if that is correct, that consumers, meaning businesses, and retail uh, consumers would only demand what is supplied and therefore businesses would provide the kinds of services um, that consumers demand. Speak to us a little bit from the consumer side, Lisa. Are they demanding the right things? Are they using ICT for the right things? Um, if not, what can we do about it? Um, there's the newspaper report this morning uh, and last night that um, um, people are making use of social media in a very big way. And, and I really was taken aback. I know there are a lot of things to be taken aback about this, this report, but um, this, I wondered how her mother was able to so arrange <laughs> to be on Facebook, was it? And, and, and so, I mean, I mean, the older generation, the younger generation, everybody's using it. Um, but are they using it for the right things? And how could we, could we influence that? Yeah, thanks, Dr. Ramkisun. Um, excellent questions. 
So you would have heard Professor Cavillo talk about the usage index and where we score. We actually improved overall one point. But there are three sub-indices in usage. There's individual, there's business, and there's government. And in fact, if you look at the, um, some of the uh, most positive and strongest movements that we saw in the indices came in relation to the individual usage um, components. So we moved from a uh, ranking of 79 to 69 for households with internet access and we move from 50 to 47 for fixed broadband internet uh, subscriptions, and we moved a remarkable 108 to 92 for mobile broadband subscriptions. Um, so you, the devil is in the details, and the devil is in the analytics that you apply to, 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 to the data. Now, the um, I think the reason, and, uh, and there are some people in the audience here who will readily agree with me, that the reason for the improvement in the individual and some, some extent the business usage uh, uh, indices um, are directly correlated to the rollout of the uh, 3G HSPA plus mobile networks, i.e. 4G networks, of the two mobile providers in Trinidad and Tobago. We see that borne out not just in these positive movements, in these sub-indices, we see them as well in the uh, quarterly marketing reports produced by the Telecommunications Authority. Uh, we saw, based on their last quarterly marketing report, that 30.7% of the population use mobile broadband. That equates to roughly about 400,000 uh, subscribers, which is up, I think, 19% from the prior year, which is great. Um, and one of the things that I want to, it was mentioned by Ms. Miraj in her speech, um, and, 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 I, and I want this takeaway from the audience. It's not that just that the government is going out to um, invite a new mobile operator for Trinidad and Tobago. The government is actually inviting applications for Spectrum to deploy LTE services. So, so there's a tranche of Spectrum that's going to be available to um, an existing operator as well as the new provider, hopefully. Um, and that will enable that new provider uh, and an existing operator to provide LTE or LTE advanced services, depending on the spectrum allocated. And we, we can expect to see as a result of that, Dr. Ramki soon, one, a bigger take up in customers using mobile broadband. Okay. Um, and I could talk a little bit about some of the global trends, which would blow your mind. Um, we can see a um, quintupling at least of mm. speeds using LTE or LTE advanced technology, um, are we going to see a significant uptake uh, in mobile broadband subscriptions? Let me just give you a little bit of, uh, just a little bit of info in terms of what's happening globally. Right now, there are about 1.5 billion mobile broadband subscribers across the world, um, with growing um, on average 50% per annum so, so they expect that by 2018, which is the end period of our national ICT plan, global uh, mobile broadband subscribers would be 6.5 billion. Mobile data traffic doubled between 2011 and 2012, moving from 620 petabytes to 1,280 petabytes. We are not immune in Trinidad and Tobago from the effects of this insatiable demand for data. With the um, evolution and the deployment of the new technologies, we are fully poised to take advantage of some of the um, developments and growth we're seeing in the rest of the world. 
and the government and the telecommunications authority are to be commended highly. And I'm not saying that just because you're on the board, Dr. 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 But um, for, yeah. for going ahead with this thing. But let me just put two caveats to the, to the um, uh, auction on, on, or for the, uh, the third mobile operator and for the spectrum. It is my um, suggestion that it will not be successful unless there's tower sharing, unless there is sharing of um, other facilities by existing operators, and if there's number portability. So I highlight three essential prerequisites from a policy perspective for the success of, of, of attracting a third mobile provider. And I, and I say this wearing a policy hat, and, and not an old hat that I used to wear. <laughs> um, and, and it's significant because there is no way a new provider can come and build 215 new cellular towers in Grenada and Tobago, not with the town and country requirements that were put in place years ago. So the existing operators have to share their facilities in accordance with the law. Lisa, thanks. Thanks very Can much for, for that. Uh, Lisa has given us quite a lot to think about and has spoken about some of the positive things that are happening uh, in respect of what the ministry is doing, what the telecoms authority, and I just want to say hi to the representatives of the telecom authority mm -hmm. that are in the audience. And um, I'm sure you uh, take time off to come to this because you understand the importance, the importance of it. Um, I have Kim on my right who uh, has something very important to say in respect of <laughs> what Lisa was saying. Bouncing out of her not, seat. I will not pull her back at all. Yeah. It's basing at, basing at the seams because it was a great segue. Thank you. As Lisa was talking about broadband usage, as he, she's talking about the um, desire for tapping in. We talk about innovation. Consumers, consumerism, yes. Content creators mm -hmm. also. With mm -hmm. all this increased speed, upload speeds, download speeds, it positions us to be creators of, of content, content, not just consumers right. of products and mm -hmm. services. Right. So I would have to do a plug for the ministry here and talk about the work with respect to the open data, data. strategy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So part of the World Bank engagement that Ms. Mirage spoke about includes an open Indeed, data yeah. strategy for innovation in Trinidad and Tobago mm -hmm. that we are very excited about that will help us make that shift from consumers to content creators with those high speeds, with the access, with mm -hmm. all the exciting things that Lisa just mentioned. So I thought it's important yeah, thank you very much. that in we fact, speak to innovation yes. in that regard. I think, yes. I think my panelists are working as a team because just when I'm about to go to the next person, the, the next person that I'm thinking about has his hands up already. Lokan, Thank you. Um, or a little bit about this, um, the possibilities that are, that are showing up where people are using um, in Trinidad and Tobago, Amazon to do a lot of their purchases, and we keep asking, well, why aren't we doing more e-commerce? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I know you would like to speak to that, but if you can take <coughs> on board as well, the issue that lies behind what Kim is raising, yeah. the, 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 yes, the creation of content and the role of the private sector in that, in that aspect, because that, again, is linked very much to employment, economic activity, doing things with the technology that would add value to the GDP. Lokan. Sure. So I'd like to just take a few steps back and then sure. come back around to Lisa and Kim and, and then address your question. So first of all, um, going back to Salvon, and you had asked what's in the main problem. The main problem is not about technology or about infrastructure. It's about our competitiveness as a nation. I would say that the, the big problem that we, that, that we face is we are not a competitive nation, basically. And it's, it's, um, 
90. You know, you, yeah. you, I'm quite outspoken, so I'll, I'll just say it as I, as I see it. Um, you have this term, you know, God is a trinity, and that is one of the causes, because in the, in the business community, in the consumer community, in government, uh, we're not a competitive people. And we can have as much technology and, and innovation around us, but you can't force the horse to live in water, right? Okay. So I think that's the main problem. Um, coming back to Lisa's comment on LTE, I have right now two projects which are waiting on LTE in order for them to be viable. And so that's just a testimony to kind of pent up demand yeah. for something like that. The yeah. present broadband, present mobile broadband infrastructure not will not support, support. These, 